the leader's guide had this to say, which I really liked. It's, uh, salvation comes to anyone who believes in Jesus. We all know that, and for those that don't, that's an important thing to know. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, that Paul declared that God never plays favorites. In a letter to the Galatians, he added that there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. All people are made in the image of God, and all people are sinners in need of salvation. So no matter what your what our background, each one of us is precious to God, and each of us can come to him through personal faith in Christ. Which, and then it uh, gives John fourteen six, which says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come unto the Father except by me. So we have to have Christ in our life um, in order to know the Father, in order to experience what all he has for us. They skipped chapter 10, and for the life of me, I can't figure it out. There's some important stuff in there. <laughs> and we'll do a quick overview to get us caught up to, cha- uh, to verse 34. But I really wished we'd have studied the first part of chapter 10, because to me, there's, there's stuff that needed to be looked at. So beginning in the first part of chapter 10, Peter has an encounter with a uh, man that's going to challenge him on everything he has ever thought about salvation as a Jew. This man's name is Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. He's an army officer that lived in the coastal city of Caesarea. This man is a devout, God-fearing man. Verse 2 states that he was also a man of action that showed generosity to those in need, especially the Jewish community. He was also a man of prayer. It was important, and he did pray often like we're commanded to do. Uh, One day during his prayer, he's visited by an angel of God, The angel tells Cornelius that God is answering his prayer and that Cornelius needs to send to Joppa for a man named Peter. (coughs) So Cornelius obeys these godly instructions from this angel. And while Cornelius is sending servants to get Peter, Peter is in the midst of praying on a rooftop as well. During his prayer, he becomes hungry. Peter begins to receive a heavenly vision, and this vision is a white sheet containing animals that Jews were forbidden to eat, according to verse 13. And a voice tells him to kill and to eat, but Peter tells God, no, this is not okay to do. I'm not going to do that, and he refuses, stating that he never has eaten anything that is ritually unclean or impure. God tells him, whatever I call clean should not be considered unclean. So Peter has this vision appear to him two more times. As Peter's having this vision, he's confused and he doesn't understand about what God is trying to tell him. So while he's reflecting on this vision, trying to figure out what's going on, the men that Cornelius had sent, these three men, uh, they show up at Simon the Tanner's house, which is where Peter was staying, uh, they arrive and they give Cornelius' message to Peter. So Peter invites these three men in, which is way not okay, according to Jewish custom, because these are Gentile men, and they was not supposed to be in with the Jews' home whatsoever. Uh, But anyway, Peter invites them in. And while they're there, Peter entertains them. He allows them to spend the night with him. Um, So, like I said, this was totally unheard of. Peter is told by the Spirit to go with these three men and to have no doubts about what he's doing. Um, Because these men are sent by God to do this to bring him to Cornelius. 
So the next day, the four men head to Cornelius' house in Caesarea, along with some brethren of Peter's. So some of the, possibly some of the other apostles, some of the followers, I'm not sure it doesn't state who, but some of the people go with Peter, along with these three men that was sent by Cornelius. In verse 24 through 26, while Cornelius awaits for their arrival, he calls together some family and friends into his home. And then when Peter arrives at his house, Cornelius falls down and is worshiping Peter. But Peter lifts him up and he says, no, I'm just a man. You're, I'm not the one that you need to be worshiping here. And so... But Peter wants to make sure that Cornelius understands this, and he makes it very clear to him. In verses 27 through 29, Peter finds many people that has come to Cornelius' house and has joined together. Peter tells them that according to Jewish custom, it's unlawful for him to be there with them. To keep, He says, it's unlawful for me to keep company with another nation of people, meaning the Gentiles, so he explains that God showed him he should not call any man common or unclean. See, I'd never heard this before. I always just, when Peter had that vision of the white sheet coming down, and I guess I've never really studied this before. So this was kind of new to me. I never re really made the connection here. But yes, so God is saying these animals are okay to eat, and that's what the white sheet is. But what he's also saying by showing and dropping that white sheet down is, <coughs> excuse me, he is telling Peter that there is nothing unclean. My people are everybody, not just the Jews. You know, the Jews were important, but but the Gentiles are just as important to God as the Jews are, and they're not um, they're not singled out to to be more important than anybody else. <laughs> and so so anyway, he's <laughs> that was the purpose of the white sheet that we've seen in verses eleven through sixteen. Um, so Peter knows that the Jews or the Gentiles are needing to be taught about Jesus as well. And that they are made clean and acceptable by God also. God made everyone clean and acceptable by the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Because God showed Peter this, Peter tells Cornelius, I came without objection because you sent for me. And Peter asked Cornelius, why did you send for me? Peter's not understanding really still what his purpose is here, but it's going to become evident here real soon. <laughs> and so without that vision that Peter had with the white sheet, he would have never been a part of this calling. He would have never went to Cornelius' house and spoke to these people that he's fixing to speak to. Uh, God had to prepare Peter just like God had to prepare Cornelius and this group of people that's meeting in his house. And so God told Cornelius to call on Peter to come and to speak to the people about God and what he has commanded. And we know that was the great commission that the, the apostles were commanded to go into the world and make disciples. So God has prepared the heart of Peter's audience for this message as well. We need to prepare our hearts as we prepare to go to church to hear God's message to us. Who got prepared this morning? So, Nancy. It's, it's important that we do that. And I struggle with this because I'm not one that thinks ahead, so I'm usually last minute doing everything. And so, but it, it is important. You know, we need to take that time to pray in the morning. We need to take that time to open ourselves up to God and, and say, okay, God, speak to me. Use me or show me what it is, you know. And so it's one thing for the pastor to prepare a message that God has for us through through him and what God's going to have him say. But if we're not prepared to hear that message, then it's lost on unprepared hearts and people that are distracted. So, and that's, 
Sunday morning is a perfect time that Satan is just all about getting Christians distracted. Because the more he can keep us distracted, the, the less we can learn about what God wants us to know. So, so that gets us up to our lesson today in uh, verses 34 through 48. And so <clears throat> in 34 through 36, it says, Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God does not show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news <coughs> of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if you would, please. I thought I was going to get by without it, but it just doesn't seem to be working. And I cannot remember my cup to save my life. <laughs> so... Uh, thank you, Maggie. So, in verses 34 and 35, Peter knows there is a lesson that God is trying to teach through this vision that he gave him. And because of the vision, God puts together a meeting between this Jew, who is Peter. Thank you again. Um, uh, hopefully that works. <laughs> So God puts together this meeting between this Jew, which is Peter, and this Gentile, which is Cornelius. And through this event, Peter says, now I truly understand. So Peter's figuring out what the vision meant and what God's trying to say. Because of the vision God showed Peter, and he knows now not to call anyone unclean or impure, these Gentiles are no different than him. He, uh, they're human beings. They're God's children. They need this message just as badly as the Jews do. And so it states here that God shows no favoritism or partiality to anyone. God accepts everyone who fears him and obeys him. Every nation being acceptable refers to someone being welcomed into God's presence. We know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that that verse teaches that are all, all are created in God's image. Every person, past, present, and future, has been created in God's image, and they have the same rights to know about uh, their salvation possibilities as well. Then we would look at Romans 3.23, which teaches all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there's not one of us that is any more special because we can do better or we're, we're more equipped or anything. None of us are perfect. None of us uh, are worthy of what God blessed us with, that gift that he gave us. Every person needs a savior. Even though the Jewish nation is God's chosen people, that is the, for the purpose of the line of the Messiah rather than special treatment. So, and nope, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> the Jews felt they should never help a Gentile in any way, shape, or form. There was nothing, this is what they believed, there was nothing that they were, in fact, I read in one one of my studies, I think it was David Gusick's commentary that said that if a Jew married a Gentile, that they would have a funeral for that Jew and consider him dead. And it probably, yeah, uh, because he, he broke Jewish law and they're not supposed to mar intermarry with the Gentiles. And so, uh, yeah, I found a lot of interesting stuff. If, the, if a pregnant woman needed, was in need of assistance and a Jew was around, they would not assist because they felt that this woman was bringing another Gentile in the world and that was not okay. So they have, they have some crazy ideas back then, I guess maybe still today. <laughs> um,
Oh, wow. So, yeah. And that was never God's intent at all. And we're exactly, because that's what I was going to say, is because in the Old Testament, the, the goal of the Israelites was to be a light to the nations, that they might come to the Lord and look at different people like Rahab, like, um, what's her name, Ruth, or, you know, all these people that loved the Lord, and they were brought in, and then became in the line of Jesus. You know, that was God's goal all along. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they they got way off. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and so yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Peter, this was a definite lesson for Peter, and in the in the fact that God is using Peter, He's also drawing a nation of, or a group of Gentiles into uh, into salvation. He was going to say, Paul. Paul was really reaching out to the Gentiles. He could have said, Paul. Yeah. Yep. So, so, and and I think this is a good sign of of showing us that you know, regardless of our situation, God is working with us to do what He needs us to do, and He's also working with the people that He's sending us to, and we see this very clearly here with Peter and Cornelius. We have to know that that's what God does with us too. So if you ever go on a, on a mission in your own power, in your own strength, you can know and trust that you're, it's probably going to be a failure. You know? But if you're truly working with God and God is sending you to do this, he'll go ahead and he'll get everything in place that needs to happen so that, so that it isn't a failure. And, and whatever God is needing to achieve will come to be. So Yeah, that's true. Some Jews do not believe that he is the he was the Messiah that came and and so yes, that's true. Um So as I said, the Jews never felt that they should ever help a Gentile in any way shape or form. God wants this to change and so God wanted them to share his love with the Gentiles the Gentiles had a place at the table through Jesus's sacrifice as well so we often think God sees color he only sees the heart God we think oftentimes sees someone's economic status he does not. He only sees the heart. It's just us that sees those things. Exactly. <laughs> it's us that sees those things. He doesn't see nationality or ethnic group. God sees the heart. And we can't, you know, we can't ever assume that somebody's um, forgotten about. That's not the word I wanted, but anyway, forgotten about because of, of who they are or their standing or or anything like that, because God loves every human being, because he created them. Eileen? And, and he wants everybody to be saved. I mean, it's the free will that they choose Jesus or not, you know? And we just hope that the poor, the needless hope that they have been changed. Yeah, yeah. God doesn't want, you know, we see that in John 3.16. God doesn't want anybody to perish. You know, he wants everybody to have that opportunity to accept his son and so um and it's our job as christians to get the word out to keep telling the story as flo says and so 
Um, <clears throat> Christianity is the first religion to disregard racial, cultural, and national limitations. You know, the, the, the religion chooses to do that, but so oftentimes the people within that religion still put up those barriers. We have to, as Christians, we have to knock them down, just like God did here with Peter. And so the gospel is for all nations, and for Peter to say that God's gospel is for all people, this was a radical statement. This was scandalous uh, for, for the Jews and, and the people that Peter interacted with for him to say this as an observant Jew. And what Peter is saying is you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. So, and that's addressed by Paul. I can't remember where. I think it's in Thessalonians, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but making this statement was the foundation for the way the gospel would spread to the ends of the earth. As soon as God gets everybody on board, then this message can spread out. And, and we see, and that's... That's one of the things I like about being a Southern Baptist is the fact that we do have the cooperative program and we are sending missionaries out into the world or to the ends of the earth to, to witness and to draw people to God, you know. But it's just not for those missionaries that are specifically called. It's for every believer to do and to be a part of. In verse 36, God sent his message to the Israelites through Jesus, which is his incarnate son. This message proclaims the good news or the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ. This message was not meant to stop with the Jews or the Israelites. It was for all people. No one was excluded because of cultural or personal background. It is for any person that is willing to repent and place their faith in him and believe in him as Savior and Lord. So my first question here is, uh, why might some people feel someone is excluded from God's salvation offer? Why do we think that? We don't think they deserve it, you know. But then we'd have to ask ourselves, well, why do we deserve it? <laughs> yeah. Amen. What did you say there? Oh, amen. Yeah. Thank God God is impartial and has no favorites, Eileen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and. Exactly. Uh, and we, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people in our world still that feel because you are of a certain race, you're, you're not worthy of God's love. You know, because of an economic status, you're not worthy of God's love. You know, and we can put any tag on that, you know, as, as to why, because everybody has a prejudice about them, and with that prejudice comes the idea that we think that somebody's not worthy of the love that God has to offer. You know, when we forget about Genesis 127, where it says we are all created in God's image, and so every person created is uh, worthy equally for the love that God has for others. And so we have to watch our prejudice. Uh, the next question on there is, what response should we make when somebody thinks he or she is beyond hope and cannot be saved? Because we all know, we've all dealt with somebody like that, I'm sure. Jesus yeah. died for all of us. Jesus died for all of us. And so, and you know, I know there's people that think because they've committed a sin so egregious that God can't love them. You know, um, maybe broke a law, maybe killed somebody. You know, I don't know. We all know what something. Um, but right. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. But yes, and thank God that it is. And so, but, you know, when you're that person, when you are looking, you know, you know what you've done, you know that horrible thing you've done, it's really hard to believe that you are worthy of of having um the ability to have God love you, you know, and and forgive ourselves. Yeah. We, Yeah. Just like yeah. Sin, that's exactly and that's right. Yes. Yes, that's true. Eileen? There's been people even on their deathbed that have sacrificed yes. before they died. And, and just thankful for that. Yeah. 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 And so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and I think if we look at it in the sense of being worthy, we are worthy only because of what Christ did. Yeah. That that's what makes us worthy is what Christ did on the cross for us. But outside of that, no, we're not worthy of anything. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, yeah. Yeah. Nancy, did you have something? Yep. Yep. So yeah, and and it's truly because of God's grace, and that is the only reason we we have anything, and and we can even consider being worthy is because of His grace through His Son Jesus. So, Eileen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and yeah, just like I said that it's only because of the love of Jesus for us that that we have the ability to be worthy. <laughs> so in verses 37 through 43 it says, "You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth was sorry how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the holy spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him we ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So, 37 and 38, we see that Peter begins his message to those who are gathered at Cornelius' house, and he reminds them of the events that took place in Judea and Jerusalem. Um, and it started in Galilee after the baptism of Jesus. But Peter says here in this verse 37 you know and saying that he's speaking of the events of Jesus's ministry his death his burial and then the resurrection and we can be positive that this story spread far and wide as people shared the events and as they heard about Christ after his resurrection these are the kind of stories that spread and and these are the stories that the Jewish leaders did not want spread because they're wanting everybody to believe that Jesus is dead and and that is not 
you know, that's not what's happening. So in verse 38, Peter tells how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, and he is referencing Jesus' baptism, and then after Jesus' baptism, we know, I think it's spoken in all four Gospels, that the Holy Spirit descended on uh, Jesus once he was baptized. And at that point, God confirms that Jesus was his beloved son, and he is affirmed as the Messiah, the one sent to save the people from their sins. Jesus is anointed also with power, and he goes about doing good and healing the people. The kingdom of God has arrived, and during Jesus' earthly ministry, his works, he proved that he is unique among the rabbis and the teachers. And his compassionate works provided freedom from the tyranny of the devil. And it broke the chains that held humanity captive and without hope. We see here that God's plan through Jesus was to liberate people from Satan's tyranny. And Jesus' ministry would ultimately benefit all people everywhere. Not just the Jews, it's going to be the Gentiles too. God sent his son for everyone. In verse 39, Peter and the others were witness to all that Jesus did and spoke during the time that he was here. They experienced Jesus' ministry, and because of this, they are charged to take his message to the ends of the earth. To the Jew and to the Gentile alike. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in wherever God sends them. And we know in the world today, throughout the whole world, God sends his missionaries to, to take his message to everybody so that everybody has that opportunity. Peter didn't preach one message to the Jews and then a different message to the Gentiles. Every person he spoke to got the same message. And it was uh, that they all needed to come to a living faith in Jesus Christ. And this is why God called Peter to witness to Cornelius and the group of people that was gathered at his house. It is likely that some of the other apostles was here. We know that when Peter left uh, Joppa and went with these guys to Cornelius' house, it said that other people went with him. These people that traveled with Peter and these three men from Joppa was apostles, and they were people that had witnessed uh, the things that were spoken of Jesus, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and what all he said during his ministry as he walked the earth and healed and, and uh, touched people's lives in the dramatic way that he did. And so... Peter says that the Jewish leaders put Jesus on that tree. Peter holds them accountable and responsible for the death of Christ. And it was the Jewish leaders that was responsible for that. And they did many illegal things to get him up there on that cross so that they could take him out and people would not... They thought that would be the end of it and they wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. But little did they know God's plan and what God was capable of. <clears throat> so here in verses 40 and 41, Peter continues his message to tell the people that God raised Jesus up on the third day. After Christ was raised up, God allowed him to be seen by those that God appointed as witnesses. Not all the people that was alive at that time got to see Jesus after his resurrection but the witnesses that God allowed to see um, they they were allowed to eat with him drink with him they were allowed to touch him and by them being able to experience Christ in this way after his resurrection their witness is the evidence of the physical bodily resurrection to be a believer, we must accept this fact because logically it leads to acknowledging who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. 
He is the sacrifice for our sins and the one who conquered sin and death so we could have salvation. He offers forgiveness and hope to all who will follow him. And without the resurrection, the Christian gospel is false and Christian faith is worthless. We have to know, we have to recognize, and we have to believe that that event took place um, in order to have salvation. In verse 42, Peter now turns to the message that Jesus commanded his disciples to preach to the people. <clears throat> we, as his followers, we as his uh, believers and who he is, we are to testify of Jesus as the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Now, the word testify here means to declare solemnly. So this is like giving a testimony under oath in a courtroom. And as we do, we have to realize it's a truth of extraordinary importance. The fact that Jesus is judge of the living and the dead shows us God gave him to dominion over everything. He has the power to save and to judge. And this is more proof that he has authority from God. God gave him this authority because he works hand in hand with the Father. They are one. So Jesus is Lord of all people, not just the Jews. And how people respond to his gospel of salvation will determine his judgment on them. And he has the right to do that. <clears throat> so. In verse 43, Peter stated that the prophets testified about Jesus. And we know because of our studies in the Old Testament, we've studied many of the prophets uh, during Sunday school here. And by these prophets testifying about Jesus, this is saying, uh, or Peter saying here that uh, he's invoking the entirety of the scriptures from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. The Bible is the book about God's love for humanity and the salvation he offers through Jesus. The Old Testament foretold the coming of Jesus and that he would fulfill the law of God and establish, pe establish peace between God and humanity. Jesus is the Messiah, and all people, whoever believes, can find forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. So we, <coughs> oftentimes people think that the Old Testament is irrelevant today. But if we didn't have the Old Testament, we wouldn't know about these prophets. We wouldn't know about how God used these prophets to come and to talk to the nations and trying to get them to, to straighten up and, and behave in the manner that God wants them to behave. And so um, we have to realize the importance of the New Testament along with the importance of the Old Testament. Eileen? Right, and it's, um, I lost my thought, <laughs> so, but yes, you're right, um, you know, we need, we need both, oh, that's what I was going to say, uh, they are, uh, well, I was, I was getting, going to get to that as soon as I made the statement that because the New Testament foretells of the coming of Christ, we need that information too, now say what you were saying, Joyce. The old is the new concealed, and the new is the old revealed. Amen. And so, okay, and I, I knew you had that, and I... <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, I was getting to it, and I'm glad you brought it up. So <laughs> and so, because, yeah, both books are important, you know, and, and we need both to write. We need them to come together so we have the complete story of God and his plan and, and Christ and what God planned to do with all of that. So, Yeah.
Yeah, because we can learn a lot about God in the Old Testament, you know. Yeah. And so people think that that's really a harsh, uh, harsh, he was really harsh. And, and he was really harsh. But it's because he's dealing with the people with, that have, have no concern or no desire to live as God chose them to be. And so... Yeah, trying to get them, <laughs> trying to get them to be like what Maggie was talking about—that that light to the world, you know, so that so that God's people doesn't have to die. So, but <clears throat> so in verses forty-four through forty-eight, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Excuse me. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then they asked him to stay for a few days. So in verse 44 here it says, As Peter is sharing the gospel with the group of the Gentiles in Cornelius' house, the Holy Spirit descends upon them. We know that this same thing happened at Pentecost when uh, Peter was preaching there. We know that in Peter's earlier sermons, he usually concluded by calling for his audience to repent, to believe, and to follow Jesus. But here we see no such invitation recorded because Peter's in the midst of delivering this sermon to this group of people when the Spirit of God moved among those that was hearing this message. And these people are starting to believe. So the Holy Spirit is manifested to this audience, affirming the gospel is indeed open to them. They're getting this realization. They're, they're knowing and they're feeling that they are needing to go in this direction to accept Christ. Peter said in verse 43 that anyone who believed in him receives forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> With that statement, it began to resonate with these people. These people are ready and they're eager to take that next step to accept Christ, to be, uh, to be in the in the um, presence of the Lord. God heard their hearts as Peter opens this door that was previously closed to them. This open door now allows them to be accepted and to respond in faith. In verse 45, the circumcised believers, uh, or the Jews who had come with Peter, were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit was being poured out on these Gentiles. This was not something that in their minds should have or would have ever happened. The people of Israel were always meant to be God's conduit of blessings to the whole earth, like Maggie was saying. But as they came and as they experienced the things and as they struggled to stay faithful to God, they lost this purpose and they become uninterested and they became ignorant of those that were outside of their nation. They came to believe God's blessings were meant for them alone. So here we see in Acts, it is proof that God's purpose never changed. All those who chose to follow God will be blessed if they believe. God expects his people to be the ones who shares his message with the world. That's us, believers. Um, and as we share, God is expecting us to include everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. And yeah, we should be witnessing to the Jews that don't accept and believe all of this. So these circumcised believers that were with Peter saw some things that went against their convictions, went against what they'd been taught all their lives, what they knew to be true. 
and it caused them to be amazed at what was going on, and what they saw also confused them. It was unexpected, and it did not make sense to what they had been taught up to this point. Peter had saw the same thing happen at Pentecost. He saw it at Samaria, and now he's seeing it here in Cornelius' house. God gives his spirit to uncircumcised Gentiles. God accepts them as followers of Jesus, and they are included among his people. It is clear that those whom God accepted into his kingdom, the church must also accept into their fellowship. We have no right to exclude anybody that walks through our door. And we should be out there encouraging everybody God puts in our path to walk through those doors. So. Yeah. This one man was just hungry. He was just so hungry. And I let him be Joyce's customer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yet <laughs> he, he was, I, I don't know if he was born again or not, but in the obituary, he was a good man. Well, a lot of good men are going to hell. Amen. That's so true. You know, just because we're good, we're, you know, not we're not good enough. No. We won't, and our our goodness is that is filthy rags. That's, exactly That's the best we can achieve on our own. So, Eileen, and we are not promised tomorrow. We are not promised this afternoon. Right. So we have to know and 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 believe what God is telling us here. If this is not a salvation message, if this should not this should be piercing people's hearts. Yes if they do not know the Lord. And this should be piercing our hearts as believers to get this message out. For those of you not attending Tuesday night Bible study on Revelation, that scares the bejeebies out of you if, yeah. you've, if you've never studied Revelations. And yeah. we have a responsibility as believers to make sure those people don't have to go through that time that Revelation speaks about. So we need to get committed to that. So... I think I'm in 46. I lost track. <laughs> and so, But in verse 46, it says, As the Holy Spirit is poured out, they hear the group speaking in tongues, and they declare the greatness of God. God pours out his spiritual gifts as they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So these people are getting the spiritual gifts as they are receiving the Holy Spirit. This feeling of the Holy Spirit, it has two aspects. And the first is that it is God indwelling and abiding in every one of these believers. Second, it is the aspect of a special empowerment, uh, empowering with gifts and grace from the Holy Spirit. I've said it before, I'll keep on saying it. If you're sitting here, if you're a believer, you have some gift, at least one. I know you have at least one. Yeah. Many people have more than one. Find out what your gifts are and start using them in the service to God because that is so important. So, as these gifts are poured out upon them, uh, and we know that the speaking in tongues was given to magnify God, it, you know, and I'm not even going to get into that because I don't understand much of that either. <laughs> so, but anyway, there was a purpose in they ha having the ability to speak in tongues, and that was to magnify God and for no other purpose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, said that it's a language that the devil doesn't understand. And so, okay. So... In verse 47, Peter asked if there was any objection to these believers being baptized. They received the Holy Spirit the same as these Jewish believers did. They need baptism just as badly as anybody else. It's necessary for them because of their genuine inward transformation of faith as a believer in Christ Jesus. 
And Peter here, he's calling for their baptism. And as he calls for their baptism, it affirms their conversion to Christianity. They need to be welcomed into the church and into the fellowship of believers. In verse 48, Peter commands these new converts to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> My lesson book brought out, and I don't know if this is factual or not, but it says Peter does not do the baptisms. It says Peter commands them to be done. So we're going to assume that he's having probably the people that went with him, the other apostles, the other followers that traveled with them, um, to have these people do the baptisms. And so this, these Jewish Christian brothers uh, are doing the baptisms in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, the lesson brought out that we must know and understand that baptism does not save anyone. That's right. Baptism is for just being obedient to God, showing that we uh, have had a transformation inside, uh, and we want to profess that to the world so that we can confess that we now walk with the Lord. And so after Peter's sermon, he is asked by these new Christian friends to stay for a few days. And so this will allow some time for more instruction in the faith, just as Jesus commanded. What we see here is a type of hospitality uh, that reflects God's willingness to welcome all kinds of people into his kingdom. We need to be having the hospitality as well. Uh, as we see, we've seen Simon do it with um, Peter inviting him, the tanner, Simon the tanner, to Peter to stay with him. You know, these people are now inviting Peter to stay with them. We need to be hospitable to the people God puts in our world that needs hospitality. So we also see here a transition in the history of the church. Social standing and ethnicity was important to Peter previously, but we see those walls come crashing down in this lesson today. Other Jews may have questioned Peter's faithfulness, but what we see here is Peter is obeying God's call. He is not being um, held to the dictates of human beings. He is doing what God called him to do. We are called to follow Peter's example. The gospel is for all people, and that includes those we think that are out of the realm of God's love. His offer of salvation through forgiveness of sin is an open door to anyone who is willing to walk in. 1 Corinthians Oh, was the clock wrong? Oh, well, I'm way over. <laughs> or Actually, I'm right on time for me. <laughs> and so, but okay, I'll hurry up, finish here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So we're only where we're at as believers because of the grace of God. His and if it was sufficient. his grace is sufficient, we would not be here if we didn't have it. Real quick, I'm going to skip the questions that I had at the end because I want to go over this. There's a thing in, um, in Christianity that is called the Romans Road. And this is a good way to share the gospel with a non-believer. And it shows them that or is a need for Christ as their Savior. I'm going to just give you the scriptures, look them up. Um, one of them is Romans 3.23, which we already went over. The other one is Romans 6.23. says the wages of sin is death, but the, right of, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I wasn't going to read these. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Romans 8.1. Then we have Romans 10.9. And read, it says 10-9, but I went ahead and read through verse 13. And those verses are important, as I think it goes along very well with what the rest of that has to say. And so, anyway, any questions or comments this morning? I appreciate all of your input, and, and it's very 
it's very helpful <laughs> for me to hear your guys' opinions as well. So I appreciate all of you that choose to share during class time. So anyway, uh, Flo, would you close for us, please?